Well, grace to you and peace be multiplied to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What's going on, Beacon Hill? How y'all doing today? Awesome, man. Happy birthday to us. We've been here five years today. Praise God. Can y'all believe it's been five years? My goodness gracious how time flies, man. It's been a blessing. We came here uh, five years ago on faith. We literally walked in this door, and we rented this place uh, for seven weeks. And it wasn't any theological significance behind the number seven for us. That's just literally all the money we had. We figured we'd be here for seven weeks, and we would see what God had in store. When we came here, the naysayers said that uh, Hopewell didn't need another church. And I got news for them. We didn't come to be another church. We came to shine the light of Christ in every corner of Hopewell, Virginia, and I hope that we have done just that. We've come to reach people far from God with the love of God. We walked into the streets inviting anyone and everyone to come to church and worship with us. And as I said last week in my sermon, the news would tell you that people aren't interested in religion anymore. And you know what? They don't want religion, they want Jesus Christ. That is what we have found as we have walked through these streets. People are very much into Jesus. See, religion pushes people away from Jesus, but Jesus draws people to himself, and we have seen God do that in a mighty way. The old saying that people don't wanna know what you know until they know that you care. I have been very blessed to be pastor of this wonderful fellowship of believers who have been authentic in caring about lost souls and the needy in this community. We don't pretend to have it all together here at Beacon Hill. We're jacked up. We're flawed people, but we're here to tell you about the one who is flawless. We are imperfect, but we want to share about the one who is perfect. We are not better than anyone else. We are all equal at the foot of the cross. Amen? And so I'm thankful for that. In the midst of it, we have flip the script of the statistics that said that 90% of all people who come to Christ in America are under the age of 18. Here at Beacon Hill, 90% of the people who have come to Christ in the last five years are over the age of 18. We should never assume that people know about Jesus or that people are not interested in Jesus. It's up to us to eliminate the question altogether. We have seen young people come to Christ. We have seen seasoned people come to Christ. We have seen an explosion in our 20s ministry. We have seen drug dealers come to Christ, addicts come to Christ, and everywhere in between. And we are thankful for what God has done in our midst. Matter of fact, if you have been baptized here at Beacon Hill over the last five years, would you take a moment and just stand at this time? I just want people to see what Christ has done in and through this body of believers. Thank you so much. I, I, I didn't plan that. I, I just want people to know um, that people want to know about Jesus. People truly want to see Jesus and know about Jesus. And so as we start year six, I would challenge you to keep growing past your comfort zone, to allow God to do more than you could ever think or ask. As we say here at Beacon Hill, to really allow yourself to get comfortable being uncomfortable, to allow God to do more than you could ever possibly dream of. And if you're a guest here today, we thank you for being here at Beacon Hill. At Beacon Hill, we don't do anything special. We just preach Jesus and Jesus crucified. And it's that Jesus I want to preach to you this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, it's preaching time. Go ahead and grab your Bibles. Open them up with me to Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. If you don't have a copy of God's Word with you this morning, just raise your hand and one of our Beacon Hill peeps will bring you a copy of God's Word for you to have. Maybe you just forgot it. Man, take one and give it to somebody else. Here at Beacon Hill, we believe you should keep the Word of God open as I preach because as I say every week, it's not my words that can change your life, but the words that I preach that can change anyone's life. Right now, if you're able, please stand in honor of reading God's holy word. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Thank you. The word of God says this. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. The 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks 
Lord God, the Almighty, who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great. And the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder, an earthquake and severe hail. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you, um, Lord, for every soul in here today. Lord, I thank you that um, you've allowed us to be here. And Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take that for granted. Lord, um, people sometimes get caught up in the building that we're in, but Lord, I hope they see the, <laughs> the church um, as a body of believers who are just sold out and been transformed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ that want to make a difference in this community. Lord, I pray right now for people within the sound of my voice, Lord, as I preach your word, Lord, that, that the Holy Spirit be working on their hearts. Lord, if they don't know you as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation for them. Lord, that they wouldn't have one foot in the world and one foot in the word. They would go all in for Jesus. Lord, I pray that I would decrease now, you would increase, and you would get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I have entitled today's message, The Sound of Victory. The Sound of Victory. When I was started this sermon, I started thinking about some prayers that I grew up with. Um, there's three prayers that I remember as a kid. One of them was the mealtime prayer. Anybody have that standard prayer before they said their blessings? God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we are fed Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Who remembers that one? Apparently a lot of y'all, right? Who still uses that one, all right? Okay, there we go. All right, so that was, uh, and then we had a nighttime prayer. We had a nighttime prayer that goes something like this. Now I lay me down to sleep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. What a jacked up prayer that is, man. Maybe that's where my anxiety started as a five-year-old. Now, we need to pray to God in case you die while you're sleeping tonight that he would take your soul. We've got to come up with something better than that, right? But the third prayer that I learned was something called the Lord's Prayer. And who, the Lord's Prayer is something, and, and I don't know about you, it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I learned that the Lord's Prayer is not really something to be recited in vain repetition. It is a model of how we ought to pray. And I didn't know that. So, I mean, that's how I prayed. It was just really my standard prayer. And, and probably for a lot of us here today, it is a standard prayer. But I started thinking this um, week while I was preparing the sermon about the opening lines of that prayer. It says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Have you ever stopped and thought about the first lines of that prayer? Like, like, have you ever thought about what it means to pray for thy kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven? Because I don't know about you, I just go through the motions and I didn't really process what I am praying about when I pray for his kingdom to come. Is the kingdom to come a future event? But isn't his kingdom here now? Which one is it? And the answer is both. And I want to share with you this morning as we dig into Scripture exactly what that means and that we would learn together what that means. And so in verse 15, we see first the sound of victory. The sound of victory. The seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. We're coming off this interlude that has kind of paused in between the trumpet judgments, and we spent a couple of weeks doing that, and it's been a month since we talked about the last trumpet judgment. But the trumpets are part of the seventh seal. And if we go back to the beginning of chapter 8, when we see the trumpet judgments um, um, introduced, we see that there was silence in heaven. 
We see that there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. When we think about heaven, we think about rejoicing, we think about nonstop praise, but yet in Revelation chapter eight, we see that there will be a period of time where heaven is completely silent for a half an hour. This just tells us really the, the reality of what will come in the final judgment that will cause all of heaven to stop praising for 30 minutes and be in complete silence. That is why when we get to this text this morning, it's kind of a surprise what we see. When the seventh trumpet is about to be blown, I would expect maybe even an hour or two hours of silence, but we see quite the opposite when we get into Scripture this morning. We see the choir in heaven singing. We see him singing, singing the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. So let's talk for a few moments about what it means for the kingdom of the world becoming the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Do you know that Satan is currently the ruler of this world? That Satan is currently in charge? There are many scriptures that points to Satan being in charge and that one day he will be cast out. He is actually even called the prince of this world. Satan has a grip on this world and the results are an all-out rebellion against a holy and righteous God. First John tells us about some of those results of people rebelling against God. We see the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride in one's possessions. It's how things are in the fallen and broken world that we live in today. See, you don't have to look far to see how jacked up this world is. Some of us don't have to look any further than our own hearts to see that we are far from God this morning. And we look at this, we look at how God created in the beginning in Genesis 1, God created the world, he created the world perfect. But what we see today, church, is anything but perfect. We're in the midst of anything but perfect. God created this world perfect and it is imperfect. And I don't know about you, it can get discouraging. It can get discouraging at times just to see how jacked up this world, how much hate, how much sin, how many people are rebelling against God. But the encouragement that caused heaven to go from silent to all out praise is that it won't last forever, church. All this pain, all this hurt, all this sin will not last forever because Satan's reign has an expiration date and God's reign will last forever. The kingdom of God will come and usher in his reign that will last forever and ever. See, Satan's reign is temporal, but Christ is eternal. Now, we might say, Pastor, does that mean what you're telling me, that Satan is in control today, that that Christ is not in control? Not a bit. Christ is still in complete control. He is allowing Satan to have authority here in this earth right now to reign on this earth just to show people how futile it is to live life without him, to push people towards him. Satan thought he was in control. Satan wants to be in control, but he knows that he can't win. Matter of fact, he took Jesus when he thought Jesus was at his most vulnerable, keep in mind the word thought Jesus was the most vulnerable. When he was tired, he took him up into the mountains and he showed Jesus the kingdoms of this world and he says, you can have it all, Jesus, if you would just bow down and worship me. Jesus looked him in the eyes and says, You shall worship the Lord your God and only the Lord your God and I will serve only him. Away from me, Satan. Jesus could have took the easy way out, but he came for a purpose. And instead of bowing down to Satan, he did what he came to do. He lived his life, the life that we couldn't live. And he died the death that we should have died. He gave his life up on the cross of Calvary as a substitute 
for your sins and my sins, so that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. When the world thought that Jesus and Christianity was over, Christ conquered the grave and rose victoriously, saying, you may think you're in control, but I will always be in control. That ticks Satan off. That ticks Satan off because he can't do anything about it. He can huff and he can puff, but he will not blow Christ's church down. So don't assume that Christ is not reigning today because he is. The Bible calls him the king of righteousness. The Bible calls him the king of peace, the king of heaven, the king of glory, the king of ages, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, the great I am. Today he rules over the spiritual kingdom, but in a future day he'll reign over the nations of the world with a rod of iron. No matter how difficult the circumstances that you face today, no matter how much that you are, are pain and, and disturbed by what you see, you can take encouragement that there will be a day where there will be no more pain, there will be no more suffering, there will be no more tears, where Christ will reign forever and ever. And while the heavenly choir celebrates the God who created and sustains the world in Revelation Chapter 4, verse 11, here in verse 15, the heavenly choir celebrates the God who will come and reign forever and ever. And we see not only the celebration that will take place, but we see the thanks of what is taking place in verses 16 and 17. It says the 24 elders who were seated before God on their thrones fell face down and worshiped God, saying, we give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Here in verse 16, we see the 24 elders literally fall out of their chairs and worship him. We have seen the elders before in Revelation chapter 4 pray the creator. We have seen the elders in Revelation chapter 5 praise the redeemer, but here in Revelation chapter 11, we see the elders praise and worship the conquering king. They fell down and gave thanks. This is the only time in Revelation that you see the word translated from the Greek, thanks being used. They were thanking God for the response of the prayers that they offered up and saying, how much longer do we have to wait? Have you ever uttered those prayers? How much longer, God, do I have to wait? How much longer, God, do I gotta go through this pain? How much longer do I gotta go through the suffering? Anybody in here with me today? Have you cried out to God saying, how much longer you can know that God hears your prayers and he will answer his prayers. Maybe not in your timetable, but in his timetable. See, in John's day, the church looked at it, it was defeated, that Rome was in charge, that they were the conquering king. What is he doing? Does God even care? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever asked that question? Does God even care what's going on? Does God even care about me? See, that Satan is trying to do a, a work in your life. It may seem at times that the throne is empty, but it's not. Don't mistake the silence of God with the inactivity of God. God is always working even when we can't see it. The elders were given thanks for God completing his plan of salvation by ending evil and introducing eternity. And so when your present looks bleak, all you have to do is look to the eternal and what is to come. But there is more to give thanks for here in this passage, and I, I love this. You ever heard the words, we praise God who is, who was, and what, and is to come. Do you notice something about these verses that is missing? It says who is and who was, but it doesn't say who is to come, because he is coming. And in this verse, he is already here. Notice it is dropped off here. He will come and take his reign forever and ever. This acknowledgement should be encouragement for you because God is sovereign over the past and God is sovereign over the future, which means God is sovereign over your circumstances and what you are going through today, church. 
He is sovereign over the present. He is sovereign not over part of history. God is sovereign over all of history. The God who is in control of the past and the future is also in control of the present. So even though the external situations and what you see may see that evil is reigning, that evil will take over, that Christianity is going extinct, Christianity is going nowhere, and Christ will come back, and he will usher in his reign, and we will worship him forever and ever. So maybe you need that encouragement today. Maybe you need that encouragement to keep on going, to keep on fighting the fight. Maybe you're struggling with doubts, insecurities. Maybe your faith is being tested today. Be encouraged that God is someone you can count on even when you can't count on anybody else in this world. Satan is just a wimp in the hands of a mighty God. And we can praise him for that. But then we see that the sounds of victory and the sounds of thanks but we see the sounds of anger in verse 18. The sounds of anger. The nations were angry, but your wrath has come. The time has come for the dead to be judged and to give the reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to those who fear your name. Both small and greater, the time has come to destroy those who destroy the earth. In just a few short verses, the people went from celebrating the death of the two witnesses to complaining about Christ coming back. Man, their arrogance and their joy did not last for long. What, you think about it, what do these people who are rebelling against God have to be angry about? When you really think about it, the people here even today, the people in this world today who are rebelling and who are angry against God, what do they rightly have to be angry about? Because even in spite of them rebelling against him, he is providing for them whether or not he, they realize it or not. He's giving them territories. He's postponing his judgment. He is long-suffering. He's giving them time to repent. He sent his son to die on the cross for their sins, whether or not they realize it or not. He's offering forgiveness. What in this world could people be angry about against God? Romans 1.25 says they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served. That has been created instead of the creator. It literally blows my mind that people are angry at God. And what blows my mind even more are atheists. Atheists have such a hatred towards God who they don't think exist. That's just a special type of jacked up. How can you be angry at something like, that just doesn't make sense. That's just anger to a whole new level. People want to live their life their own way. They don't want rules. We've seen that in the last year and a half, haven't we? People don't want authority. They're rebelling against police. They're rebelling against the, the, the government. They're rebelling anywhere they can. We, we're seeing this really escalate. We're seeing the hatred and the people saying, I know better than you. People want to live their life their own way. But it was always, always proved to be futile. We deserve death. Every single one of us in here. Every single one of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we deserve death. But thank God, he doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us what we do not deserve. He gives us himself. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God is long-suffering towards lost sinners, and he often postpones his judgment. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life, it's only by the grace of God that you're even taking the next breath. Don't waste it. Give your life to God. There won't be a chance to work it out with the big guy. There won't be a chance to plead your case about how good you are. There won't be a chance to thinking you're going to go to hell and party with all your friends. The Bible says... At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. There will be no exceptions. Those who repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Lord of their life will have an eternity in heaven, and those who refuse to repent and turn to Christ will spend an eternity in hell. There is no in-between. It's either heaven or hell, and it's your choice which one you want. Here's the great thing in verse 18. It says, to the saints and those who fear your name, both small and great. And it talks about three classifications of people who will be spending eternity in heaven. And I thought about breaking those down. 
But really, when I got down to it, I, I really was pierced by these words, those who fear your name, both small and great. There is room in heaven for everyone. In my time in Hopewell, in the last five years, I have seen countless people who think that they can't be forgiven for what they've done. I've had people tell me that God couldn't possibly love them. God couldn't possibly forgive them. I've had conversations in this back parking lot with a guy who just shot up. I've had conversations with drug dealers. And people say, you don't understand. I would come to church, but church would burn down if I came in the building. You don't, you don't understand what I've done. And you know what? I don't understand what you've done, but I know what I've done, and God forgave me for that, and he can forgive you what you've gone through in your life. I've had people... I've had people that said, you know what? I've killed people. God can never even forgive me for that. I said, let me tell you about a guy named Paul in the Bible who was one of the most evil persons that you've ever seen. He took Christians and tied them up and he killed them and yet he is one of the best messengers for Christ. The fact of the matter is, should God tarry and not come back, there may and there will be another pastor at Beacon Hill and it may just be the drug dealer on the street who is preaching to you next Sunday. Don't ever doubt what God can do in your life. And you're here today and you think God can't forgive you. I'm telling you, God not only can forgive you, he will forgive you. He will make you new and whole again. And you can be used in a mighty way. Is that you today? Do you need to give your life to Christ? Do you need to turn from your ways? Do you need to stop playing the field and thinking, man, what I am doing, how's it working for you so far? How's it working trying to drive your own bus? Get out the way. Matter of fact, if if God is your co-pilot, there's too many pilots in the seat. Get out the way and let God take control of your life. Look, God loves you. All you have to do is receive his love. And God is faithful. As the band comes up and we get the prayer team to come up, we see the faithfulness and his promises in verse 19. It says, the temple of God in heaven was opened and the ark of his covenant appeared in the temple. There was flashes of lightning, rumbling, and peals of thunder. The chapter opened with the temple on earth and we close it with the temple in heaven. And the focus, attention is always on the ark of God. The symbol of God's presence is with his people. In the Old Testament, the ark stood behind the veil and the holies of holy. God's glory rested on the ark and God's law was within the ark, illustrating the two had never been separated. It's a lot of stuff when you get into this ark. But they had not seen the ark and it was important to them. And for them to sit there and get a picture of the ark was just seeing how faithful God is. And maybe you're here today and you're doubting your faith and you're struggling with things in your life. All you have to do is look to God's word to prove his faithfulness. God is faithful. He will complete what he said he's going to do. So maybe you're struggling with doubts. Maybe you're hurting today. You don't know which way to turn. I'm asking you this morning to lay it down at the feet of Jesus, to lay it down all your burdens, all your hurts, all your transgressions at the feet of Jesus and let God make you new this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord of your life, would you allow Christ to reign over your life, to stop getting Satan a foothold and give your all to Jesus? Would you do that this morning? I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask you to respond. I don't know what your hurt is, but I got to tell you, that every single one of us is going through something in here this morning. You can, you can act like you don't, but I didn't read your Facebook pages. And God knows your hearts. So I pray you would lay that down today and let God work on you this morning and use you for his glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you to be able to be here today just to praise your holy name. I thank you for knowing that our earthly struggles are temporary. Lord, this time, whatever time we have here, it's just a blink in the, in the midst of eternity. Lord, I don't want to go through life without a purpose. I don't want to go through life just going through the routine, just saying prayers that don't reach my heart. The fact of the matter is, a lot of people miss Jesus by 18 inches, the distance from their head to their heart. Lord, we know enough about God, but we need to receive Christ as Lord of our lives. And so, Lord, I pray this morning, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you, 
that they would get the boldness to come forth and lay it down at the feet of the altar. Lord, the baptism's already filled. Or we just give this time to you. Maybe there's a hurt, there's a hang-up, there's something going on that we just need to lay down. We, we have the encouragement to do that. Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and respond.